All right, we're going to pick up with part two of the Art 101C 420 2020 uh, lecture on the Nazis, Jesse Owens. And maybe we'll get a little bit of, of uh, Norman Rockwell in a moment. All right, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Anissa, can you hear me okay? There's Alejandro's door, everybody. There's Alejandro's door. We saw it for a moment. All right. Anissa, you hear me? Matthew, do you hear me? I'm muted. Yeah, I hear you. All right, great. So, and can you, I think you can't see this yet. Let's share this image. Just a moment. All right. So we're gonna pick up uh, here with Jesse Owens. You see some pictures from this event, and then we're gonna hopefully get time to look at Norman Rockwell. Some a little bit of Norman Rockwell just passed over. So you see the picture, okay, Matthew Soames? Yeah, I do. All right. How about this one here? Yep. Oh my God, so, Anna, so, so what, what are we looking at here? An explosion. Uh, it looks like an explosion. Yeah, so where is this explosion taking place? Um, it looks like on, like, near the water. So near the water, good. And what about the very top? What do you see at the very top? A uh, palm tree almost. So is it Florida? Is it Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor, right. So the, the, the photographer was very smart to get a little bit of the palm tree in there so that we would know, for, for the record, where we are, which is, of course, Pearl Harbor. And why is Pearl Harbor significant, Jake? Uh, that's kind of like when the for a U.S. got attacked for the first time. And who attacked us? Uh, <coughs> um, oh my God, why can't I remember this? It's okay. Wasn't it uh, Japan? Yes, good. Japan attacked. Japan was an ally of Hitler, and they attacked us, and that got the United States compelled the United States to join World War II and uh, join the Allies. And the rest, as they say, is sort of history. Um, and I think you guys all know more or less the br broad brushstrokes of World War II. But what I think is also interesting is you will we'll see how World War II blurs the boundaries between races and genders. And why do you think it does that, Jake? What, what about war has a blurring effect on boundaries that might exist before war? And you might consider that in terms of Napoleon. He got rid of the, the kings and queens, right? The American Revolution got rid of the aristocracy. And, blends everyone. So what about World War II? Why does war blur the boundaries, uh, Jake? I think everybody was just so power driven. They didn't really care what was around them and they did whatever they had to do. I like the logic there, but it's not quite, uh, not quite why. But I like that you're this sort of power absolutely is a sort of major component. But that's more for the aggressors, right? Like the Hitlers, the Japan, they want territory. And maybe you could say that's more important than other boundaries. Sure. But I think there's another element to war that transcends those differences. What do you think that is? What is it about war that, that transcends these other, I think you could say, petty sort of differences? Let me get, put it another way, Jake. What about the coronavirus transcends our petty differences? It brings everyone together. Yeah, and, and for the sake of what? Uh, everyone to... else's safety. Yeah, winning, right? Not getting killed, right? So there's a survival instinct that transcends the other instinct or, or the desire to, to divide people. So what you see is during war, and it's a fascinating silver lining to a very dark cloud, which is war, a very, very bad thing. The silver lining is that you see blur, a blurring of boundaries and a, arguably a more uh, a more a more accessible, transparent society, which I think we live in today. We really live in the fruit of, of the, 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 the eerie fruit of war, the sort of bitter fruit of war is the society we live in today under the specter of the atom bomb, which keeps us at peace. So here, let's see a little bit of what I mean by that. Uh, let's see, Anna Sheck, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, what do I, what's, what boundaries are being, being blurred in this image? Or what? Um, yeah. Gender boundaries, I guess. And, and what do you mean by that? Well, women of the time didn't typically work, so war well, they might have done. They might have done certain, I'm sure they did some work, right? and you could say how working in the house is absolutely work. Like, there's no denying that 
at mm -hmm. this time a woman value as a mother and a homekeeper was ac absolutely valuable and worthy of sort of celebration. But what changed specifically as far as the kinds of work they did, Anna? They took more manufacturing jobs and jobs that men typically worked in. There you go. Right. So the, they, they started doing the jobs that were historically jobs that men did. And why did they start? Did, was this because the president of the United States or Americans said, hey, you know what? We should have more women working and therefore they're going to work. Is that what happened? No, it's because all of the men went to war or were involved with other things. And so how does that relate to uh, how the women, why the women are working? To, I guess, keep the economy moving and provide the tools necessary for war. Right, so the entire United States works for the war effort, right? Everyone wants to survive because if you don't, Hitler might invade and you might get rounded up and sent to the concentration camp. So that's, and that's not even, like tongue in cheek, that's like a literal, like if you don't obey social distancing, you might get your family sick and they might die. And the worst thing than dying of, of coronavirus is killing your parents with it, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the worst thing. So you could think about war as a survival thing where everyone equally wants to help out because otherwise you're doomed. And so the reason why you see a blurring isn't because necessarily people have a heightened morality, but because there's a heightened sense of survival that requires everyone to participate in spite of any differences that might have existed before. Now, there's a caveat to that, which is after World War II was over, you see a shift back to the sort of models that were there beforehand. But I think once you let that cat out of the bag, once people get a taste of sort of the sort of different lifestyles, you can't really, it's like once, a, once your mind has been open, it's like a parachute. It's like you can't really close. Um, unless you fold it up a lot. So that's a really uh, important observation about war, that it blurs boundaries. And what are we looking at here, Anna? I honestly can't tell. I don't know what those things are. Yeah, and they're almost like pretty magical looking. They've got the lights reflecting off of them. It almost looks like, like a, hair, a hair salon, those things are there, moving off. Are those parts of the planes? Yeah, which part, are they, which part of the plane are they, Alejandro? where the, the pilot like enters and sits down. Yeah, that's right? the cockpit, right, the cockpit. So these are the, the cockpits of the plane, like the, the, trans, the window glassy cockpit so they could see 360 degrees or 180 degrees. And who are the people inspecting it? Well, women. And there's a certain kind of, it's hard to figure out perhaps what's going on because it's something oddly uh, jarring about what you might expect. And also because it's a manufacturing assembly line, the repetition of these forms and the sort of prefabricated form that we see here repeated over and over. It's almost like the CGI movies where they just copy and paste the, all the armies. And it's like groups of armies and copy and paste that groups of armies, like just numberless uh, rows of these things. And it's really showing you the manufacturing production of war, the, the uh, use of all of America's resources to fight World War II. By the way, do you, I don't know if you know that, but Mexico contributed something like half of our raw materials for World War II. So more than 50% of the raw materials that were used to make these kinds of things were contributed by Mexico. So thank you, Mexico, that was awesome. Uh, so the United States, North America is all enlisted. And Alejandro, what about in this picture? Um, what are we looking at here? An explosion. Right, an explosion. What's being exploded? It looks like a city. Or right, this is like Google Earth, right? It's like the same view as Google Earth here. And, and what's doing the exploding here? Um, I'm not very sure. It, it, it looks like it's coming from the sky, so maybe like from a plane. And uh, do you see those little more detailed, darker spots there on the top? Yeah, I what, think so. Yeah. What are those? Maybe if I do a little arrow mm. piece in right here. What are those? Anyone else know what those are? Anissa, do you know what those are? These are the bombs, right? Mm. So, these, so here we're looking at the bombs falling. Now, Anissa, how does this, what does this photo tell you about war? In, as, it, as it is in, the, in World War II. What is new about war? Or what's notable about war now? We got you there, Anissa? No, Anissa? No, Anissa? You there? Maybe, maybe, Alejandro, maybe. go ahead. 
the the technology it's progressed a lot and what do you mean by to progress what what can what, what can technology do now it can go like a flying in the sky and just like throw bombs wherever they want right so in a way the, the unlimited range and power of war for one what else does it say i, I don't i don't see any a uh, person that so i don't know if it's a drone right so, probably a plane right dropping the bombs so why is that significant can the person who's dropping the bombs see the person that they're dropping the bombs on no and why uh, is that significant why do we care about that and uh, maybe there's like a less of an emotional like attached to it right and you could say a more like a less of a moral sort of yeah. reckoning a moral sort of consequence there's and we, we, get, and we and we could also say it's a more protective of the person that's doing the attack yeah yeah the, i mean you could say it's sort of like uh, like almost unfair or just yeah. too destructive but but i like the first point you said which you don't see the people you're killing so there's almost an anonymity a sort of callous cold anonymity to killing right you yeah. you to to push a button and kill someone by dropping a bomb is like a video game almost. It's like a, a video game version of death, but this is of course not a video game. What else is important here? Uh, Michael, what else is important about this bomb dropping? What can we observe that must be going on down below? Um, what else is important? Hmm. Yeah, who is that bomb hitting? It's hitting everybody and anybody in yes. there. And why does that matter for what we're, um, for us? Be, because that kind of that kind of that goes against everything, really. That like the the unspoken kind of rules of war that you shouldn't be killing indiscriminately, like innocent people. Uh, that it's kind of between like thinking of wars between soldiers but it's when bombs are involved, then there's no controlling who is getting hit. So. Right, right. And think about how they're probably hitting industrial targets, right? And even the nature of, you know, going back to this picture, when you're building aircrafts on this level, of course you have to bomb this factory, right? This is of course an American factory, but German equivalent. And you're gonna bomb this factory out of necessity for war. And yet, when you do that, now you're sort of hitting civilian targets and you're going to have collateral damage with civilians. And so, yes, the war, rules of war where you have an enlisted army with, uh, with a responsibility to the country are out the window when you start dropping bombs capable of such destructive power, right? So now we're looking at war that doesn't discriminate, like you said, between soldier and civilian, but kills everyone within the range of the bomb blast. And so... War is no longer something between two men with bayonets or between two people looking into the whites of their eyes, but rather an indiscriminate, chaotic, uh, destructive event that really culminates with this. And what are we looking at here? Let me pick on someone new. Uh, Paul, can you hear me? Or William, can you hear me okay? How about Logan? Logan, you there? Courtney Sherwood? Yeah, I'm here. All right, what are we looking at here, Courtney? Um, we're looking at a bomb explosion. And what kind of bomb is that? Atomic. And what, how do we know it's an atomic bomb? What's the telltale part of a, an atomic bomb? Um, maybe the smoke that it has, like yeah, the what's shape. What's the name of this, yeah, what's the name of that cloud? I don't know. It's called a mushroom cloud, and that's sort of a sort of a way of describing the shape of the cloud. And it's a specific, unique cloud signature from the bomb blast of an atomic weapon. I don't know if you guys know this about an atomic weapon, but in order for it to be fully destructive, you don't blow it up on the ground. Why don't you blow up an atomic bomb on the ground? Do you think, Courtney? Why is it better to blow it? I mean, better, but why is it more effective or more violent if you blow it up in the air? Um, does it cover more area? Yeah, if you blow up, a, if, if you're ever worried about terrorists blowing up a nuclear weapon and destroying your city, it's not really going to do that because it will only blow up like a, a block. Because to fully unleash the power of an atomic weapon, you have to blow it up in the air and then the blast radius hits the ground below. So really, for, for a terrorist 
to be able to blow up New York City, for instance, they have to have planes, they have to drop it from a plane. And it's almost like too difficult, too many resources involved. So you guys don't necessarily have to worry about that. But more importantly, if a, an atomic weapon ever did blow up, what would happen if we ever had a full scale atomic war, Courtney? Sorry, what, did what you would say? happen if we had an atomic war between, say, the Soviet Union and the United States? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just be. Well, what happens when it? What is bad about an atomic weapon apart from just its explosive blast? What do you know about? Do you know much about what? What is the danger of an atomic weapon? Chemicals. Pass, not quite. But let, let me pass someone else. Let's see if if, if anyone else kind of knows what I'm getting at there. Uh, Anna Harris, are you there? Yes. What else is bad about an atomic weapon apart from its destructive, explosive quality? The gas in the air? It's not gas per se. Do you know, you know what the word is for what is not produced? Quite, not quite so, it's, so it's called fallout. And fallout is produced when the radioactive byproduct of the explosion, which is what ha a byproduct of the plutonium exploding, when that radioactive microscopic particles combine with the pulverized dust of whatever was hit. And that radioactive fallout is what you see rising in the air here. And it rises all the way up to the up upper atmosphere, upper way like a volcano does. It goes way up into the atmosphere. So what do you think happens with all that radioactive fallout, which is very dangerous and deadly, after it hits the upper atmosphere, Anna? What, what do you think happens then? It comes down. It comes down. And it, it comes down way in a widespread area because it's coming down from such a high up area that it really doesn't discriminate between wherever you dropped it and wherever else is located nearby. So when you think about atomic weapons, you're not really killing the people that you're hitting, you're killing everyone. You're killing, you're annihilating the territory, you're killing all the animals, you're killing all the people. And when you really have more than one atomic weapon blowing up, you're contaminating the atmosphere for probably decades, if not longer. So why is that important as far as how warfare has changed ever since the invention of atomic weapons, which you guys might know were invented by the United States and dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, thus ending World War II? What, do you know, what, what is important about atomic weapons, Anna, as far as warfare is concerned today? Because it has a later response. Uh, but have we dropped any atomic weapons since World War II? No. And why not? Because of the effects of it. Now we've, we've of course, dropped them as far, far as uh, proliferating nuclear weapons until we've banned that, but not on any wep any enemies or whatnot. But what, what did you say, Anna? Because of the effects of it. The and, and, effect. and so, and what are the after effects if, if we did drop more bombs? That, like, say if there's other people there, like our people, they're still gonna get they're still gonna get killed in the process too. Right. So it's almost like Armageddon. It's the end of the world if we ever go to atomic war. You agree? Yes. And so, have we had w another world war since World War II? No. And would you do you think there's a would can you credit the atomic weapon with that? Arguably. I guess I don't know. Right, and what do I? What do you mean? What? What? How is it? How is it a de deterrent from going to war again? Because no one wants that to happen to them. Right. So if we go to war again, like a world war, there's no world anymore. As Einstein fam famously said, World War Three or World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones because World War Three will annihilate the war, the world, and all of this art history we've learned which we've learned like, probably about 2,000 to 3,000 years of art history, we will be reverted to 4,000 years ago if we drop atomic weapons. We will no longer have anything anymore. No longer have electricity, no more science, no more ability to have children. So we really will be ending humanity as we know it today. So you don't ever, ever in your lifetime want to support anyone who thinks war is something to be celebrated or who loves weapons or who thinks that dropping atomic weapons is a good idea because it's not because it's self-destructive. And that's why the United States probably is the best country to have invented them because 
for, I think anyone would agree that the United States was the good guy in World War II. We're not the ones committing the Holocaust. Now, the United States still has its own backyard to clean up. And I don't mean the atomic weapons necessarily. I mean um, race relations in the United States is an obvious sort of uh, uh, issue and topic that needs to be addressed after World War II, especially when you consider you know, the, the Nazis were exterminating the Jews. They had all these ideas about superiority and inferiority. And the United States was still very much a segregated country. Um, and so we're going to see how the United States uh, becomes the center of the art world following World War II. You can see some of the eras in the art world here. And particularly how it sort of wrestles with consumerism, women going back to sort of the role of mother and house, housewife. And, but, but really the role of machinery in liberating women from that role, I'll get back to that in a moment, but also how race relations um, become a sort of key topic in the sort of final or most recent sort of uh, modernization, updating of the American sort of fabric and our sort of understanding of what, what, what is valuable to us. So first, what about machinery? So when I talk about, well, when I say, that uh, technology liberates people, and specifically in this case, liberates women from historical roles. What do you think I mean by that, uh, Anna? Because they had different parts. Uh, what do you mean by parts? Like jobs. Uh, what do you mean? Can you re-ask that, sure, sure. sorry. How does technology liberate women from the historical role? as housewife or mother or housewife? Mm. So do you, do you see the picture here? Yeah. So what's that machine? I doing different chores? I'm not quite sure. Sure, so that's quite fine. Anyone else want to take a stab at that one? Oh, Logan, how about you? Taylor, how about you? Yes. I didn't understand the question. How does technology liberate women from their historical role as housewife? Um, how many of you ladies know how to sew? Not many, I'm guessing. And, I do. Oh, good. I'm glad. Sewing is a great skill. I know how to sew. It's very important. I learned it in home economics, which is an interesting title, home economics, right? What is the most, let me reframe the question. What is the most liberating technology ever invented for women, ever? Would it be birth control? Ding, 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 ding. Michael gets a brownie point. Ladies, I was hoping you would say that, but Michael beat you to it. What do you mean by that, Michael? Why, how is, birth control. Now, of course, you could say, well, birth control is a pill, but it's technology, isn't it? Isn't medicine technology? Yes. Yeah, it's the application of science, engineering. So how does birth control liberate women from, and what is it liberating women from? Uh, well, they just have greater control of contraception. So like they can choose uh, when they, you know, it's family planning, they can- right put career stuff ahead of being a mother. Right, so in a way you're liberating women from like nature. Nature has a sort of desire to make us procreate and yada, 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 and is out of our control until the modern era, including things like infant mortality rates start declining, and women are now in control of their own womb or their own sort of decision to have a child or not. And they're not dependent on men to sort of sex but you think about it there's also another side to that which is up until this era if you wanted to have sex usually you would have to get married in order to sort of have that sort of to enjoy that part of life right so there's always a trade-off um let me invite this person who's coming in here so here we see another example of technology oh, by the way any, everyone understand that how birth control is a technology and how it liberates people from liberates women i hope that's crystal clear and it really is a game changer for society um what about this technology that we see here 
what's what is this technology? Anissa, are you there? No, Anissa. Jake, how about you? Or JP, are you there, JP? Yes. So what is she doing here? Um, I am not sure. What, what, what might it be? Honestly, it looks like it's in the kitchen. Okay, uh, good. So. Just take a stab at it. So, I don't know. It looks like she's like washing, washing dishes or something. Right, something like that, right? And that's basically the mechanization of the kitchen, right? We all have microwaves, we have refrigerators, we have dishwashers. How does this liberate women from their historical role as housewives? Um, maybe they don't need to do as much hands-on work and they kind of could let the machines do the work. Right, exactly. So technology really is a, so there's several game changers in the 20th century. And two of them are war and technology. And they have very destructive effects but they also have transformative effects. And you can look on the left how technology transforms all of us by having this almost like religious-like fixation on pop culture in the form of television. So remember that, that's the backdrop really that sets the stage for, the, that's a backdrop for America after World War II. Technology and we won the war. And this artist, and we'll finish up, just we'll take a picture, look at a few pictures by Norman Rockwell, whose artwork you've probably seen. He uses his artwork um, to help sell war bonds and sort of promote the United States or help enlist his, his artistry, his creativity for the war effort. And here we can see a picture that he made after World War II. Uh, what's going on in this picture, JP? How does this relate to World War II? Uh, looks like a, a soldier's uh, telling maybe friends or family about like his experiences. Yes, exactly. So he's come back from the war and he's sharing his experience with, and who are these other people? Like you said, friends and family, they might be, you know, all people who are too old to fight in the war, right? They're old, but they might also be World War I veterans, right? You can see perhaps some details around the room that show, you know, some aspects of World War I perhaps. But yes, he, and what is he holding in his hand? Uh, is it a flag? Yeah, whose flag? Japan? Yes. So, and is he holding it as sort of like a trophy or is he sort of holding it as just very matter of fact, like it's just in his hand? I don't know. I don't think it's exactly a trophy. Yeah, because a trophy would be like he's holding up in the air, like, look at, I'm proud of. So there's something. And what is the, What about the facial expression of the young soldier? Does uh, he seem happy? No. No. So I think Norman Rockwell's already showing you it's not, he's not giving you this cliche cookie cutter idea of of war is good versus evil, but rather this kid, this guy is probably your age, like, or younger even, who knows, and he's shell-shocked perhaps from war. You, he probably saw hundreds if not thousands of people die, enemy and friendly, and that's the real memory of war, not, not and, and the story you tell is not a story of triumph, but rather a story of sorrow, a story of destruction, and, and this kid is listening on with fascination, but I think really, when you think about war, we've seen a lot of pictures of war as heroism, heroic war. And then Guernica, Picasso's painting that we saw, shows us war as a very sort of uh, indiscriminately, uh, just indiscriminate enterprise that kills a lot of innocent civilians in the middle of the night, including barnyard animals. And I think in this picture, the guy is sort of relating the war to people, like you said, afterwards. But let's look at some more pictures and, and just one more or two to tackle sort of the other subject, which is, race relations in the United States and what happens after World War II. So what's going on in this picture, uh, Dean? Are you there, Dean? Logan, are you there, Logan? William, are you there? Yeah. All right, William, what's going on in this picture? Uh, is that the uh, Selma in the uh, school of uh, race issues? Yes, explain to the rest of us what you mean by that. Uh, there were certain, uh, well, schools weren't or weren't segregated yeah. back then. Right, they weren't integrated, right? They were yeah, segregated, so there was that. Yeah, so the, the, the operating idea was separate but equal. And then during the Brown versus Education Supreme Court ruling, they decided separate is inherently unequal. 
So that's the new rule. I would basically, as if you start separating people, you're already setting up a superior inferiority and you're automatically reducing whoever's separated to a lower class. And so remember, this comes in the wake of Hitler beating Hitler. And it's sort of like you can't beat Hitler and then not fix your own backyard. Of course, there's nothing equivalent in the United States. And yet we all know, being the fruit of this era, how important it is to look past these superficial differences. Now, what, what do we see in this picture, William, that's, that's notable? Uh, four white men and one right. black. And, and by the way, the Norman Rockwell's challenge here is to tell the story of what you just described, the integration of the schools, right? But yeah. do so in, a, in one image, one image that has to really show you everything that you need to know about that moment in order to understand it, right? So you said we see four white men. Are they like evil, bad white men? Can't tell. So someone, uh, what might be an argument for or against that? Why, uh, why might they be good, good in fact? I don't know. Well, let me ask you a question a better way. Why, what is the value of not seeing their heads? You can't, uh, can't judge them because you can't like tell what they look like. Right, one, maybe they're removed from the sort of judgment, but also what, who, who does it force us to focus on by not seeing their heads? Uh, the young, the young lady. Right. So we're shifting the focus not only to her, but to the eye level of a child, right? So in a way, you can think about it. We're already like, the, the artist is framing this painting as if we are children looking at a child, which is a very easy thing to overlook. But it's almost like already making you think about this moment, not from the perspective of an adult, but from the child's perspective, because we're at eye level with her, right? It's just like in Peanuts, the char uh, what's uh, Peanuts, where the adults are like, wah, 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 and that's all the kids hear. That's sort of like what this painting is, like the adults are in another world, and we're in the world of this young girl, right? Now, what about these four men? What are they doing there, uh, William? They're lawyers, aren't they? Not lawyers. You're on the right track, though. Well, security of some sort. Right. And, and how do we know their security? Because they're uh, behind them and in front of her. Right, so they've got this, she's got this like, this, uh, this, this like protective, this posse of protectors surrounding her, which I think is a very powerful image because it's like, you know, I've never had four protectors around me. And so what are they? Are they good guys or bad guys, William? I mean, they could be either. They could just be there for doing a job or they could be good people with good intentions. Okay, and, now, and I think you, if you make a good point because, you know, people who do their job could still be bad people, but they're doing their job and it doesn't necessarily morally absolve them from other sort of things they might do outside their job. But just everything being granted and, and only knowing what we see in this picture, we can probably conclude that these guys, even if they're racist, whatever, they're still putting down their racism to do their job, which I think is commendable. But I think we can also be fair and say they're also doing their job, which is what their job and their job here is to do what? Protect her as she integrates, you know, goes to the school, the public school, and protect her from what? What are they protecting her from, William? Uh, being a, uh, well, there's a tomato on the wall. And why is that tomato there? Because uh, people are pissed that she's going to a uh, all-white school, so they're trying to protect her from getting hurt. Right, and so when we look at, when we think about color here, right, the tomato there and her dress, right? We've talked about color, and I've really tried to stress the point that the color white isn't necessarily a racial question, a racial note, but rather the color in, symbolizes what? What does white symbolize? Purity. Purity or innocence, right? In this case, I think innocence is a better way of describing it because why? Why, why did the artist put her in a white dress? Because she's young. She hasn't experienced life yet. She's, I don't know. It makes, she's innocent, right? She's innocent. Yeah. She is beyond this realm. Like, why would you not let a little girl go to school? Like, she, it's almost more ridiculous when you frame it as a young girl who just wants to go to class. Like, who would throw a tomato at a little girl, right? Like, what a, what a horrible thing to do to a person. But what do we see in the pocket of that man? A note. And what do you think that note says? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> By order of the president, yeah. cease, cease and desist. So it's really like... You could say we're looking at like Jesus and his apostles, or we're looking at, you know, someone more than just a little girl. She's like history marching forward against the sort of bitter pettiness of others who refuse to let history march forward.
and we can't see them because it's not what matters is who they are, the men around her, but that they are serving the law. And, and, and also the guy on the right has like something on his arm. Oh, what is, oh yeah, yeah. What do you notice about that? I don't, I don't it's know almost it like it's almost like a reference to Nazi Germany where you see the swastika, but almost like the good, like, oh no, there's a good side of, of society sort of doing the right thing. And it's basically, it gives him official, like that's like an, a, a mark of officialdom. It gives him an official status, right? Because otherwise we might say, oh, there's just four guys. But that is a key thing you need to see, that yellow ribbon around his, 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 his bicep, because that gives him official status. You, you agree, Alejandro? Yeah. Right. So... Uh, can we look at one more picture before you guys go? Or at least start, take a crack at it, you guys mind? So I think it's a very powerful image. Um, and we'll look a little bit at, I just want to end on a little happier note. So what's going on here? Alejandro, you can keep uh, answering. Um, I, I really don't know. This is you guys on the way to college. Here's you say, here's the dog, like, oh. I don't want you to go to college. And the dad, who's like a working guy, and the kid excited to go to college. You can see State U, it should, could say University of Tampa, on his suitcase. And Norman Rockwell is trying to capture these little moments, these innocent moments, uh, part of the sort of menagerie of American, the American moment after World War II. And so we'll pick up looking at more of Norman Rockwell's artwork uh, on Wednesday and how he made his artwork and how he blended photography and painting to sort of get the best of both. Uh, so, Nixon. yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I would just wanted to remind you, I sent you an email. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to meet with me. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if you can, like, uh, right now, like, after Yeah, 12. Alejandro, stick on, stay on the phone. Everyone else hang up, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. All right, Alejandro, you there? Yeah. So let me, I'm going to pull up what you sent me, because I did see what you sent me yesterday. But in case we, um, in case I have to go, um, I, I don't have too much time and I have uh, something I have to take care of because it's about, it's very windy and one of my sculptures might fall down. Uh, but what I want to do is take a look briefly at what you said and let me have your phone number. So if I need to call you back, Alejandro, I can do so. 787-918-1135. And where are you located right now? What? Where oh, are you located? Uh, I'm in Florida, Sarasota. Okay, great. Oh, Sarasota is nice. Is it windy over there right now? Um, uh, right now I'm in my house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty windy here. All right, <laughs> hold on. Let me open up what you sent. Let me see how it okay. All right, there you go.